The United States is racing to ensure it doesn't default on its debt with only six days remaining for the deadline. The bill will face its final hurdles in Congress. For once, both sides of the aisle seem to be in agreement, not on some newfound common ground, but with compromises. House Republicans and Democrats are racing against time to secure congressional support for the U.S. debt ceiling crisis agreement. After months of stalling and frantic negotiations from both sides, President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy finally sealed an in-principle deal on Sunday. At a Memorial Day service on Monday, President Biden proclaimed he was feeling good about the agreement reached. Look, you know I never say I'm confident what the Congress is going to do, but I feel very good about it. I spoke to a number of the members. I spoke to McConnell. I spoke to uh, a whole bunch of people. And it feels good. We'll see when the vote starts. And look, one of the things that I hear some of you guys saying is, why didn't Biden say what a good deal it is? Why would Biden be saying what a good deal is before the vote? You think that's going to help me get a pass? No. Not everybody shares this sentiment. Ultra-conservative Republicans have criticized McCarthy, alleging the Speaker failed to secure deeper federal cuts in his negotiations. Progressive Democrats, on the other hand, are equally unhappy that the president agreed to curb federal spending at all. What has irked Democrats the most is the surprise inclusion of provisions to accelerate the completion of an oil pipeline. The president has sent a message uh, at dissenting Democrats urging them to talk to him. The agreement has been a mutual climb down for both sides of the aisle. Biden initially refused to entertain fiscal cuts accusing Republicans of holding the American economy hostage. Republicans, meanwhile, failed to secure the larger cuts to the federal budget they were pushing for, instead agreeing to keep non-defense spending flat for the next one and a half years. If the deal fails to pass through in Congress on Wednesday, the U.S. government will no longer have access to funds it needs to pay off its debt. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Failure to meet the deadline could have cascading effects that could end in fully-fledged federal default. The repercussions would be disastrous for U.S. and the global economy as well. Well, for more on this, we are being joined by Kenneth Kuttner from Massachusetts. He is professor of economics at Williams College in Massachusetts. Professor, welcome to We On, and thank you for joining us. President Biden says that he's feeling good about the agreement being reached. Do you think that it will be possible for both leaders to sell this deal to their allies in Congress where Republicans control the House and Democrats control the Senate? Well, that's a good question. That's uh, really uh, sort of an imponderable. As you uh, noted in the introduction, there are a lot of opposition on the Republican side. Uh, a lot of the Republicans uh, feel that it's not as sufficient. Um, uh, not, the budget cuts are not sufficient. Um, a lot of the Democrats are happy or unhappy about the nature of the, um, the the cuts being proposed. But I should say uh, at the outset that really the battle is not about budget cuts per se. It's not about the size of, of borrowing, size of the size of the deficit at all. It's really more about the prioritization of um, the policy. So for the the actual money involved is really quite small. Uh, and as you noted in the introduction, it would simply keep spending flat for a year or two uh, and would not really entail any cuts at all. So, um, But really, this is a way for the Republicans to get certain policy changes that uh, they, they have felt very strongly about, such as denying the IRS some funds for, for, uh, for tax enforcement, uh, for imposing work requirements on our food stamps program, and uh, in decreasing the uh, regulation uh, associated with environmental permitting. So really, these are not uh, these do not have a very big budgetary impact at all. These are just ways for Republicans to push their uh, their favorite policy changes. Yet, how worried should we be if the debt ceiling isn't lifted by June 5th? After all, that's next Monday. But on the other hand, it seems no one in Washington wants to be responsible for a default. Uh, yeah, so how much should we worry? I've, I wish there were some historical experience we could go by that would allow me to answer that question. But really, this is a, an example of something that is utterly unknowable. Uh, we've come close to having uh, come to come close to defaults before. At one point a number of years ago, we came so close that the, the credit rating of the United States was actually downgraded by a notch. Uh, so some corporations here in the United States actually have higher bond ratings than, than the federal government, which is, which is pretty weird. Uh, but the um, you know the, the really two um, a number of ways in which this might proceed uh, if we uh, hit the, the the deadline and passed it without a deal. 
Um, the, the problem, you know, there are certain kinds of expenditures that the, that are not really essential uh, for the government to make. So, for instance, it might delay, you know, pension payments or payments to um, the pay of federal employees or something like that. And that would be uh, very inconvenient and uh, uh, for a lot of people involved. And for some people, it would be a huge hardship, but it wouldn't, uh, this kind of thing that wouldn't endanger the, the government's credit rating or anything like that. Um, the big problem would be if the government, if the treasury were unable to pay back principal and or interest on its maturing uh, securities. Now you're talking about a major financial train wreck uh, because the, 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 the securities, treasury securities are a, such a huge part of the financial market um, for two reasons. One is that so many other uh, securities are priced off of treasury. So companies that are uh, taking out a loan or, or lending money or banks that are lending money to others benchmark their rates off of U.S. Treasury rates, which are assumed to be risk free. So is, if the if the U.S. Treasury rate started to be associated with the risk premium, then all those other rates would be uh, would rise proportionately. And uh, the rates that people thought they were going to get would be uh, would be changed all of a sudden. But perhaps a more worrying concern is that uh, there's a, um, you know, so there are about $31 trillion worth of U.S. Treasuries uh, in circulation. Uh, and many of those are being are used as collateral for borrowing. So a, a financial institution might need some funds short term and will do if it has Treasury securities. Mm -hmm. We'll post those Treasury yeah. securities as collateral in the repo market. And if those, uh, if the re if the collateral suddenly becomes defaultable or there's a risk of default in the collateral, then the whole house of cards uh, would uh, would collapse in that uh, three three trillion dollar market, and then you could expect some severe financial fallout, um, right. um, illiquidity liquidity problems. So that that's my that, mm -hmm. that's what keeps me up. At well, night. Professor Kenneth Kuttner. Well, thank you so much for that elaborate analysis, Professor Kenneth Kuttner, joining us live from Massachusetts this morning. I look forward to speaking to you again very soon, and hopefully, we won't see that default. <laughs> yes, I hope so too.